Hello, this is Richard Hammock's Calculus 1 course. Today we begin part 2 of the course on limits. This is lecture 7, Motivation for Limits. The purpose of today's lecture is to motivate the idea of a limit, which is a key concept in calculus. The story of limits begins with tangent lines. As I mentioned earlier in the course, if you have a nonlinear function, y equals f of x, and you take a point p on that curve, you can talk about the tangent line to the curve at the point p. And one way to think about this is to take a very powerful magnifying glass and examine the curve close to p. And imagine this magnifying glass is so powerful that in its field of vision, that curve hasn't had much of a chance to bend. So for all practical purposes, it looks like a straight line that you could extend. And when you take away the magnifying glass, you have a straight line here shown in red passing through the point P that just touches the curve at P. And that line is called the tangent to y equals f of x at p, the tangent line to f of x at p. So today's goal is to find the slope of the tangent line. This is a key problem in calculus, find the slope of a tangent line. And in so doing, this will require and also motivate a new concept called limits. So again, a key problem in calculus is to find the slope of a tangent line at a point P. And if you think about it, that's problematic because to find slope you need two points on a line to calculate rise over run. And if you Think about the information given on a tangent line. The most immediate information you have is that you have a single point, a point on the curve that the tangent line is passing through. You don't have another point Q on the tangent line that's known so you could compute rise over run. So we're going to solve the problem of finding the slope of the tangent line in sort of a backhanded way. We're going to define a secant line to a curve as a line intersecting the curve at two or more points. So here is our old point P from the previous picture. Um, but this time take another point Q, but let's put Q on the curve. So you can form the line going through P and Q. And that passes through the curve at more than one point. So it's called the secant line, PQ. Now that's not the tangent line. It's the so-called secant line. But the thing about a secant line that's going to make it useful for us is that we have two points on it, so we'll be able to compute its slope, which is the rise over the run, the change in y-coordinate as you go from p to q divided by the change in x-coordinate between p and q. So now let's tackle the slope, the problem of finding the slope of a tangent line. And just for example, let's say we've got the curve y equals f of x equals x squared plus 5. And we'll single out a point p on this curve, and just for definiteness, let's say that P has an X coordinate of 1, so its Y coordinate would be F of 1, or 1 squared plus 5, which is 6. So we're interested in the tangent line to the curve at that point 1, 6. In particular, what is the slope of that tangent line? So here's the way we're going to tackle finding the slope. 
we're going to take another point x that's a little bit away from 1, and we're going to form the corresponding point q on the curve whose x-coordinate is that x. Now, that point is indicated here. Its x-coordinate is x. Its y-coordinate would be f of x, which is x squared plus 5. So this point right here, that's the point q equals x comma x squared plus 5. Now that we have two known points, p and q, on the curve, we can form the secant line through those two points. Now we're looking for the slope of the tangent line, which is problematic because we only know one point, p, on that tangent line. We can't do rise over run, but we can find the slope of the secant line. It's going to have a slope that's rise over run between the points p and q. Let's see. The rise would be the difference in the y-coordinates. So that's x squared plus 5 minus 6, or x squared minus 1. So the rise is x squared minus 1. And the run is the difference between x and 1, which is x minus 1. So here we have a formula for the slope of the secant line. And notice that that slope, x squared minus 1 over x minus 1, depends on x, which makes sense. As you change x, this point changes, so the secant line changes, so its slope is going to change. Its slope depends on x. So that's a good formula for the slope of the secant line, but we can simplify things a little bit because x squared minus 1 is a difference of two squares, which we can factor, and notice that now the x minus 1's on top and bottom can cancel and just simplify the secant slope to x plus 1. Now, in making that cancellation, it's very important that x be different from 1. Otherwise, x minus 1 divided by x minus 1 would be 0 divided by 0. The fact that this cancellation can happen comes from the fact that x minus 1 divided by x minus 1 equals 1. So you're really just multiplying x plus 1 times 1, which is x plus 1. But if ever x were equal to 1, we'd have 1 minus 1 divided by 1 minus 1. That would be 0 divided by 0, and you'd be multiplying x plus 1 times 0 divided by 0, which makes no sense. You wouldn't get x plus 1. So it's a key point. This cancellation happens only if x is not equal to 1. But that's fine, because in this picture, x is not equal to 1. It's over to the side of 1. OK, so we've got our secant slope of x plus 1. Now clearly, that doesn't answer our question, what is the slope of this tangent line? But that secant line kind of has the same direction as the tangent line, so its slope's not going to be too far off from the slope of the tangent line. But it's not the slope of the tangent line. So here is our plan. What we're going to do is make that secant line a better and better approx approximation to the tangent line by moving this x closer and closer to 1. And I'll show you that in just a second. But as it happens, as x gets closer and closer to 1, this point q is going to move down the curve, and the secant line is going to hinge or pivot on the point p and rotate towards the tangent line. It will become a better and better approximation to the tangent line. Let's take a look at that. So x moves in closer to 1. That point q moves down the curve, and the secant line rotates towards the tangent line. Now here's the point where P and Q were almost coinciding. 
and that secant line is very close to the tangent line. But look, x could get even closer to 1, maybe half the distance from 1 from where it is now, and that secant line would get even closer to the tangent line. So the secant slope should be getting closer and closer to the tangent slope. So the picture that emerges here is this. As x gets closer and closer to 1, this point Q moves closer to the point P, and as that happens, the corresponding secant line rotates towards the tangent line. Let's tally what's going on here. We set that as x approaches 1, as it is here, the point Q moves along the curve toward point P. Q is coming down like this. And at the same time, as X approaches 1, the secant rotates toward the tangent. You see that happening here. So as X approaches 1, the secant slope has to approach the tangent slope. But the secant slope is what we know. It's given by this expression. And the tangent slope, we don't know it. So we have, as x approaches 1, something we know approaching something that we want to find. More concretely, as x approaches 1, the secant slope which is this quantity, approaches the tangent slope. And moreover, this quantity, this fraction, the rise over run, we found that as long as x is not equal to 1, it doesn't matter how close it is, but as long as it doesn't equal 1, that simplifies to x plus 1. So as x approaches 1, this quantity, which equals x plus 1, approaches the tangent slope. Now look at what's going on there. X is approaching 1, getting closer and closer and closer to 1. And as that happens, the quantity x plus 1 approaches this unknown tangent slope. It gets closer and closer to the tangent slope. But if x is getting closer and closer to 1, then x plus 1 has to be getting closer and closer to 2. Therefore, the tangent slope has to be 1 plus 1, because x is getting closer and closer to 1. So x plus 1 is approaching 1 plus 1, which is the, has to be the tangent slope. So the tangent slope equals 2. This is the way we're going to tackle finding slopes of tangents, at least initially in this course. This kind of process where x is approaching some number and some other quantity is approaching some other number, has a special name in calculus. It's called a limit. And we're going to write the process that's happening on this page as follows. This is our notation. We're going to say that the tangent slope is the limit as x approaches 1 of x squared minus 1 over x minus 1 and that limit equals 2. This little notational package, which we read as the limit as x approaches 1 of x squared minus 1 over x minus 1 equals 2, mathematically encapsulates what's going on in this picture. So as we go on in part 2 of the course, we're going to distill this notion of a limit into something that we can work with and that's carefully defined. But its motivation is what's on this page. Limits are going to give us slopes of tangent lines. When you get down to it, the basic idea is this. If you've got the limit as x approaches 1 of x squared minus 1 over x minus 1 equals 2, that means that 
as we had on the previous page, x approaching 1 makes x squared minus 1 over x minus 1 approach 2. Now, of course, as we study slopes of tangent lines, we're going to use different functions, and um, we want slopes at points other than x equals 1. So the way this kind of thing is going to look is instead of the limit as x goes to 1, it might be the limit as x goes to some other number, let's say c. And instead of this particular quantity depending on x, this particular function of x, you might have a g of x, some other function. And of course, not every limit is going to be equal to 2. They could also be equal to any other number, like let's just say L. So the notational package, the limit as x approaches c of g of x equals L, to us that will mean intuitively that x approaching c makes the quantity g of x approach L. Getting x closer and closer to c forces g of x to get closer and closer to L. Intuitively, that's what this is going to mean. Now, I'll use g of x because our uh, f of x occurred in a different context. There was a function that we wanted to find the slope of the tangent line. What was it? Um, x squared plus 6. It wasn't this expression. But as we study limits, it's typical to have something like the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals l. As stated above, that means x approaching c makes f of x approach l. So our plan is to study limits in part two. Today's lecture gave the motivation for limits they help us get at slopes of tangent lines. But in part two, we're going to kind of forget about slopes of tangent lines, at least momentarily, and really concentrate on limits, how to compute them, how to find them, what they mean. And then we'll, we'll return to tangent slopes in part three of the course. So we'll put tangent slopes on hold and just study limits. So coming up, more on limits, and you can find links to all of the lectures on my Calculus One page. Go to this link or just search for Richard Hammock's Calculus One. Until next time, this is Richard Hammock, and goodbye.